Okay, so hi everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be starting a new chapter. That's chapter 7 of the textbook. The topic is work and energy. So this is a relatively short chapter. We're going to get through all of this material in just one week. And I'll be splitting uh, my lecture on work and energy into two separate videos. And you'll watch both of those videos during the second week of class. Okay, so before we get into the new content, I just want to remind you that you should be taking notes as you watch this video, just like you would in a face-to-face -face class. Uh, especially when we get to derivations and example problems, please follow along in your notebook just like you would in a face-to-face -face class because you'll always get more benefit out of this if you're actively participating rather than just sort of passively watching. So with that said, let's give a big picture introduction to where we're going in this chapter as well as the next chapter. And what we're going to be developing over the course of the next two chapters is a completely new framework to analyze and study motion. Back in Physics 44, we learned about Newton's laws, and that provided our framework for analyzing the motion of an object. The basic idea was if you understand all the different forces acting on an object, you can then predict how that object is going to move. Okay? So work and energy is a completely new framework that we can use to analyze motion. And there are some advantages to learning this new framework. So the first is we can apply this new framework of work and energy to more complex and larger systems where it's actually difficult to analyze every single force uh, that's going on in that system. The second thing is work and energy are scalar quantities. Okay, they're not vectors, they're scalars. So the equations that we're going to be developing don't involve vectors at all. And I think we can all agree that it's a little bit simpler to deal with an equation that just involves pure numbers rather than vectors. Okay, so that's what we're building up to. So throughout the course of the next two chapters, seven and eight, we're going to be developing the concept called conservation of energy. And it's going to take several weeks before we actually get there, but we are building up to this uh, in chapter 8. And the idea is that energy is something that can take on many different forms, but overall it's conserved. In other words, the total amount of energy out there in the universe is something that doesn't change. And that's a really important fact, and it's very useful for studying motion. Okay, so... The first thing we need to do is define some of our terms, in particular, the term work. So in physics, work has a very specific definition that's probably very different from how you use it in your everyday life. So we'll define what work is, and we'll start with the simplest possible case, which is the work done by a constant force. So we're talking about a force that doesn't change over time. Okay, so we'll start conceptual. The conceptual definition of work is that it's a transfer of energy from one object to another because of a force. Okay, so it's a transfer of energy from one object to another because of a force. I'm going to give you a really simple example, which hopefully will make the definition more clear. Let's say you're just standing on the ground and there's a big box in front of you and you give that box a push and you, and you slide it across the floor as a result of that, okay? Well, that's an example of work. What we say is you're doing work on the box because as you push it and you move it across the floor, you are giving it energy. You are transferring energy to the box. So that fits the definition of work. Okay, so if we're dealing with constant forces, this is how we actually calculate work, okay? The work is equal to the component of the force that's parallel to the motion times the distance the object moves. Okay, so the force that's parallel to the motion times the distance the object moves. That's how we define work. And to understand what I'm saying here, let's take a look at the picture at the bottom of the slide. So we have a box. 
you can see that it's moving to the right, it's sliding some distance D, and there's a force acting on it. If you want, you can imagine there's a rope that's pulling the box and that rope is at an angle, so it's kind of off to the right. Um, and we can take that force, the force F shown in the diagram, and we can break it down into components. So what we have here is F parallel and F perpendicular. Okay, so, so what I'm labeling is F parallel. That's the part of the force, the component of the force that goes with the motion. F perpendicular is, well, perpendicular to the motion. So the point is, it's only the parallel component that matters. The perpendicular component of that force doesn't contribute to the work. So how do we write this then? The work is F parallel times D. But there's another way we can... Uh, think about this because we can see that there's an angle in the diagram and I'll call that angle phi. That's the angle between the force, which is again up into the right, and the motion, which is just straight to the right. So the angle between the force and the direction of motion is phi. And you notice that F uh, parallel okay, is the adjacent side, right here is the adjacent side of the triangle. So it goes with the cosine function. So we can write this as the magnitude of the force, F, times D, the distance we move, times cosine of phi. That's just an equivalent way of writing the equation. Okay, so we have this definition of force that, that works whenever you have constant forces, which says that work is equal to F times d times cosine of phi. So what I want to get into now is, let's try to understand when work comes out positive, when it comes out negative, and when it comes out zero. So first of all, work is a scalar quantity. Okay? It's not a vector, it's just a number. And again, that number can either be positive, negative, or zero, depending on the situation. So let's take a look at each case. So let's Imagine a force acting on an object that goes with the motion of the object. I want you to picture this in your head. The force vector shown in red and the displacement shown in blue, delta R, the displacement, um, they're going with each other. And what I mean by that is the angle between them is somewhere between zero and 90 degrees. Okay, well, if you look at the definition of work, you see that cosine theta is there in the equation. If you take the cosine of an angle between zero and 90, you're always gonna get something positive. So that's telling us that work, in this case, is always gonna come out positive. On the other hand, what if your force is perpendicular to the motion that's happening? This is the situation I want you to imagine. The force vector, again shown in red, and the displacement, showing us which way we're moving, that's shown in blue, are exactly at 90 degrees to each other. Okay, well, one thing you should know about the cosine function is that if you plug in 90 degrees, cosine of 90 gives you zero, which means the work is guaranteed to come out zero as long as the force is perpendicular to the motion. The last case that I wanna discuss is what happens if the force is going against the motion. So the picture you should have in mind is something like this. The force vector and the displacement vector go against each other. And specifically that means the angle between them is somewhere between 90 and 180 degrees. If that's the case, if you plug an angle between 90 and 180 into the cosine function over here, you're always gonna get something negative. Okay, that's how cosine works. You always get something negative for angles between 90 and 180, which means the work is coming out negative also. Okay, so to summarize, when force goes with the motion, you get positive work. When the force is perpendicular to the motion, you get zero work. And when the force goes against the motion, you get negative work. So with that in mind, I want you to try out this problem. So after I describe the problem, what I want you to do is try pausing the video, uh, see if you can work this out on your own, and then come back to the video 
and we'll discuss the answers. So for each scenario described below, determine whether the work done by gravity is positive, negative, or zero. So in the first situation, we have a satellite moving in a perfectly circular orbit around the Earth. So again, the question is, is gravity doing positive work, negative work, or zero work in that case? Okay, situation number two, a ball is dropped and is just moving straight down. And then situation number three, a ball is thrown into the air and is on its way up. It's moving upwards. So try to see in each case if we get positive work, negative work, or zero work. Okay, so the first example dealt with a circular orbit. So a satellite moving around the Earth in a circular orbit. And so we can sketch out that orbit, sketch out the path that the satellite is taking. Something like this. And we can put the satellite, let's say, over here in the diagram. So what I want to do is indicate the direction of the force. Force of gravity is attractive, so it goes in straight towards the Earth. There's Fg. And also, um, we want to indicate the direction that the satellite is moving in. So the direction of motion is tangent to the circular path. So that'll be our delta R vector. And the important thing to notice is that they're at exactly 90 degrees when you have a circular orbit. In other words, the force going directly inwards and the motion, which is tangent to that circle, are exactly at 90 degrees. And so we saw that that means there is zero work. Okay. Second case is the ball moving down. So we drop the ball and now it's on its way down to the ground. So we'll do the same sort of thing. We'll sketch out the ball right here. We'll show that the force of gravity is pointing straight down this time. And then also we'll show that uh, its direction of motion is also straight down. So there's our delta R. So this is one of those cases where the force is going with the displacement. In other words, in this case, the, the uh, angle between the two is exactly zero. And we know that this corresponds to positive work. Okay, so force goes with displacement in this case. And in the first case, the force was perpendicular to displacement. That's how we knew it came out zero in the first case. Now in the third case, the ball is moving up. So we have a ball that's thrown into the air and it's on its way up. So we can kind of do something similar where we sketch out the path like this that the ball is taking. We can draw the ball maybe over here. As long as it's on its way up, it's fine. And we'll show that the force of gravity is going down. So there's Fg. And the displacement is again tangent to the path that it's taking. So there's, there's our delta R vector. Okay, well, we don't exactly know what the angle is. You know, it could be many different values, but we do know that it's bigger than 90 degrees and something less than 180. So between 90 and 180, by the way, this means the force goes against the displacement And we know how things work out in this case. Work is negative. Okay, so that's how you think about each one of these examples. Okay, so before we go any further, I just want to point something out, which is so far we've only defined work. We have an equation that describes work for a constant force, but we haven't really yet talked about why it's a useful concept and where we can use it. That's going to come later. So we're still sort of working on the basic definitions here. And part of that is to talk about the units. So when we have work or energy, the question is, what is the SI unit that I use to measure that? So 
The way we're going to figure this out is by doing dimensional analysis. And if you don't remember, or if you've not seen this before, uh, when we do dimensional analysis, basically what we're saying is any equation we have, we can look at the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and we automatically know that the left-hand side of the equation and the right-hand side of the equation have the same dimensions. And when we refer to dimensions in this context, we just mean the type of quantity we're talking about. So for example, if the left-hand side of my equation uh, was some type of mass, and the right-hand side of my equation was also some type of mass, that would be perfectly fine. You can set mass equal to mass. But if on the left-hand side I had a mass, and on the right-hand side I had, let's say, a speed, that wouldn't make any sense. There's no sense in which you can equate a mass to a speed. So what we're doing here is we're just saying, let's look at the formula for work. W is equal to FD cosine phi. And we'll just remember that, okay, the dimensions of work have to just equal the dimensions for FD cosine phi. So part of that is going to involve looking at uh, force. So force, one way we can think of it is in terms of Newton's second law, F is equal to ma, where m is a mass. So we would measure that in kilograms. Uh, a is an acceleration. Again, if we're using the SI system of units, this would be in meters per second squared. But overall, um, if we want to be more general, a kilogram is a type of mass. So I'll just write that as M. And a meter is a unit of length. So I'll write that as L. And then time uh, or seconds is a unit of time and it's being squared, so I'll write that as t squared. What am I trying to say here? That the dimensions of force are mass times length divided by time squared. That, that's what we say. Okay, so to go back to work, the dimensions of work are the dimensions of force times the dimensions of length, because remember, we're multiplying the force by a distance in our equation right here. So the dimensions of force, as we just said, are mass times length per time squared. Uh, and then we're multiplying that just by another dimension of length. So putting it all together, we have mass times length squared uh, per time squared. Okay, that's how we want to think about work in terms of its dimensions. So in the SI system of units, the unit of work and energy for that matter is called a joule. So this is how we understand a joule in terms of other units we've seen before. Remember, it's a force times a length. Work is a force times a length. So our unit of force is a newton. Our unit of length is a meter. So a joule is one newton times one meter. That's one way you can think about it. But also, we can think of it as a kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. Because again, it's a mass which is a kilogram times a length squared, which is a meter squared times a time or divided by a time squared, which is seconds squared. So this is how you break down a joule in terms of other units that we're already familiar with. And with that said, let's do a, a really simple problem where we try to estimate how many joules of energy a person consumes in a typical day. So the energy in the food that we eat is typically measured in calories, where a calorie is about 4,186 joules. So based on that, what I want you to do is try to estimate how many joules of energy you consume in a day, since you probably have an estimate in your head of how many calories you consume in a day. So try to work this out, uh, and then we'll go through it together. All right, so this is essentially just a unit conversion sort of problem. And what we're doing is we're converting from calories to joules. But first, we have to estimate how many calories does someone consume in a typical day, which I'll say it's about 2,000 calories. Of course, everyone's a little different. If you're a, you know, an Olympic swimmer, you probably consume like 10,000 calories a day. 
but the average person is going to eat around 2,000 calories a day. Um, and what we're going to do is take that quantity, 2,000 calories, and then just convert the units over to joules. So every one calorie is equivalent to 4,186 joules. That's the conversion factor. And what we'll do is cancel out calories like so, and then just do the multiplication. So what we get is about 8.37 times 10 to the 6 joules, if you do that multiplication. But we just really want a ballpark estimate. So how about we round this to the nearest power of 10, which would be about 10 to the 7 joules, which is 10 million. Which is to say, a typical person will eat about uh, 10 million joules worth of energy in a typical day. All right, so let's do another example. Um, and again, after I describe the problem, I'd like you to pause the video and then see if you can work this out before we go through it together. And what we're doing here is we're estimating how many calories a typical person would burn if they went to the top of the Empire State Building. So if they started at the ground floor and then walked up all those flights of stairs to get to the top of the Empire State Building, how many calories would they burn? So muscles in the human body are not perfectly efficient. In fact, only about 20% of the calories we burn during physical activity go towards mechanical work, that is moving the body around. The rest of those calories we burn, the other 80%, is basically just converted into heat. So estimate how many calories an 85 kilogram person will burn if they climb to the top of the Empire State Building, which is 443 meters tall. So there's a hint here, which is, if you're going to go upwards, you need some kind of force that counteracts gravity, okay? Gravity is pulling your body down. You need to exert some kind of force which goes upwards, which counteracts gravity if you're going to move up at all. So what you should be doing is figure out what that force is and then calculate the work done by that force if you move up to the top of the Empire State Building. That's the idea. All right, so if we sketch out what's going on with you as you move to the top of the Empire State Building, there is a force of gravity pulling down on your body, FG, but there's also, as we mentioned, some sort of upward force, which for our purposes, I'll just call it F move, and it points upwards. Also, we're assuming that you're moving up, so your displacement will also be pointing upwards. Okay, what we can do next is apply Newton's second law, F equals MA, to your body in the Y direction. And we're gonna make an assumption, and I'll write it down. If we're moving at a constant speed, then the acceleration is equal to zero. So that's what we'll do. We'll assume that as you are moving upwards, that you're moving at a constant speed, and therefore your acceleration is equal to zero. Okay, so now let's see what happens when we apply Newton's second law. I have F move going up, so that'll be positive. And I have the force of gravity going down, which will carry a negative sign. So I have F move minus FG, and that equals zero because, as we said, no acceleration. In other words, if you're moving up at a constant speed, the force that you're providing is equal to the force of gravity, which, by the way, is M times G. Okay, so next, if we want to calculate the work that you're doing, um, oops, yeah, the work that you're doing in moving yourself up, well, that's going to be given by our equation, F D cosine phi, where in this case, the force is M times G, as we just figured out. D is the distance you move up, and the angle between the force and the displacement is zero, okay? Because both are just pointing straight up. So therefore, cosine of zero goes to one, and we're just left with MGD, and we can directly calculate that. 
So the mass we're assuming is 85 kilograms. That's typical of an adult human. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. It's the acceleration due to gravity. And then D is gonna be the height of the Empire State Building. That's the distance that we move up. So 443 meters is what we'll have there. So if you do this calculation, you're gonna get 3.73 times 10 to the five. And unit wise, we have kilograms, we have meters squared because uh, we have two factors of meters here and here. And we have seconds squared on the bottom. And we know that this is a joule. A kilogram meter squared per second squared is a joule. Cool, so all we have to do next is see how many calories we burn. Because remember, just because this is how much work is required to move your body, that doesn't mean that's how many calories you'll burn because you also just have uh, heat being generated. So we said that the body is 20% efficient, which means the work we do in moving divided by the calories we burn overall is only about 20% or 0.2 as a fraction. Okay, that's, that's how we say that. So the number of calories we burn, or let's say the number of joules we burn, is equal to the work that we just calculated divided by 0.2. So that's 3.73, 10 to the 5 joules over 0.2. What do we get? We get 1.87, 10 to the 6 joules. Okay, so that is how many uh, joules worth of energy your body will have to burn in order to do this motion. But let's convert that now to calories because we typically think in terms of calories in situations like this. So we'll do the unit conversion, 1.87, 10 to the 6 joules, multiplied by 4,186 joules on the bottom and one calorie on the top. That's our conversion factor. Cancel out joules. And what we get is about 450 calories which might not seem like much. That's not even a whole meal worth of calories, but um, that's our estimate as to how many calories you would burn walking up all the flights of stairs to get to the top of the Empire State Building. I do wanna note that this is probably an underestimate because remember what we assumed up here, that you're moving at a constant speed. It's not really how you move when you're walking up a flight of stairs. It's a lot of starting and stopping again, and it's not a smooth motion. So for that reason, the actual number is a little bit more than that. But again, this is a pretty decent estimate. And that's how you work okay. this out. So what we're going to do next is take a little bit of a math detour and talk about dot products. So specifically, how do we calculate the dot product of two vectors? The reason we're doing this is that we want to come up with a more general definition of work, uh, something that will be applicable in all situations, not just when we have constant forces. And in order to do that, we're gonna have to use dot products. So let's talk about how dot products work, how to calculate them and things like that. So um, what we're talking about here generally is multiplication of vectors, okay? so. As we go through this, we're just gonna call the two vectors that we're multiplying A and B. And as it turns out, there are two different ways that we can take two vectors and multiply them together. Okay, and those are called the cross product and the dot product. So we'll start with the cross product. When we take the cross product of two vectors, we, we say A cross B, when we do that calculation, the result is another vector. So in other words, we multiply two vectors and we get a vector as a result of that, that's called a cross product. But since we get a vector as the result, we also sometimes call this the vector product. That's another name for this thing. We're not gonna be doing this in chapter seven, but we will uh, see this later on down the road in chapter 10. So just be aware that this is coming. But for now, let's talk about the dot product. And the thing that, uh, distinguishes the dot product is that when you calculate the dot product of A and B, what you get is a scalar. 
Okay, so you, you multiply two vectors together and you get a scalar, just a single number, as the result. So because of that, we sometimes call this the scalar product. And again, the way you would uh, sort of denote this is you would write down the two vectors, a and b, and you just literally put a little dot in between them. You read this as a dot b. Okay, so what are some of the properties that the dot product has? There are two that we want to go over. So first, the commutative property. This is just a statement that the order of terms in the product doesn't matter. We know that this holds true for scalar quantities, i.e. pure numbers. Uh, for example, we know that if you have two times three, that's the same exact thing as saying three times two. The same thing holds true for dot products of vectors. In other words, if I have two vectors, a and b, if I calculate a dot b, that will give me the same result as if I calculate b dot a. So the order doesn't matter. That may seem sort of obvious and almost like it doesn't need to be said, but as it turns out, once we get to the cross product, we'll see that this property doesn't hold anymore. And with the cross product, when you change the order of the terms, you get a different answer. So it's worth saying that for the dot product, when you change the order of terms, you don't get a different answer. You get the same thing. All right, the other thing is the distributive property. And you can kind of in a nutshell say that a product of sum is equal to the sum of products. So let's kind of sketch this out with an example. Uh, let's start with numbers, pure numbers, right? So if I have two times the, the quantity in parentheses, three plus four, we know that we can distribute that two into the parentheses and write this as two times three plus two times four. So it's important to know that the dot product works the same way. If I have vector A, and then I dot that with B plus C in parentheses, that's the same as A dot B plus A dot C. So it distributes just like numbers do. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's finally define the dot product. How do we actually calculate a dot product? So if I have two vectors, A and B, and I want to calculate A dot B, this is how I do it. A dot B is equal to the magnitude of vector A times the magnitude of vector B times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. So we'll call that angle uh, theta just for the purposes of our calculations. Okay, so let's get a sense of how to interpret this equation, what it's telling us. And we'll do that by drawing a couple diagrams. So in the diagrams on the slide, Vector A is shown in red, vector B is shown in blue. And I've connected the two vectors together by their tails so that the, the tails are connected and there's an angle theta between the two vectors. So how do we interpret the dot product by looking at these pictures? Well, the dot product is just a projection of one vector onto another vector. Let's see how that works. Let's start with the diagram on the left side over here. So if I take vector A and I project it onto vector B, this is how you would do that. You take the tip of vector A right here and you draw a line down onto vector B that's perpendicular to vector B like this. And you'd simply then just measure the length right here that vector A makes onto vector B, which if you do the trigonometry works out to A cosine theta. Well, notice how a and cosine theta appear in the dot product expression. That's almost exactly what we have here, except we're also multiplying by the magnitude of b. So it's like you're taking this projection, a cosine theta, and then you're just multiplying by the magnitude of b. That's what the dot product formula is telling us. And by the way, it also works if you project b onto a, right? It works the same way. So now let's imagine taking the, the tip of vector B, which is right over here, and then projecting that onto vector A like this, then this projection, this distance would be B cosine theta. And again, if I take B cosine theta and multiply by the magnitude of A, that's the dot product. Okay, so it's really intuitively about projecting one vector onto another. So 
the maximum value of the dot product is always going to be achieved if the vectors are parallel because you'll get the biggest possible projection. And then also if the vectors are perpendicular, you're always going to get zero because one doesn't project onto the other. Another way of thinking of that is that if your angle here is 90 degrees, then this will always work out to zero. Okay, so that's a little bit about the dot product. Well, we also need to think about how we can find the dot product of the unit vectors. So remember, the unit vectors are very important in physics. Uh, I'm talking about i hat, j hat, and k hat. And remember what the purpose of the unit vectors really is. So the unit vectors allow you to break any vector down into components. That's what it's really for. And these three unit vectors correspond to the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction, respectively. So i hat points along the x direction, uh, j hat points along the y direction, and then k hat points along the z direction. And they all have a length or a magnitude of one. That's what it means to be a unit vector. You have a unit length or a length of one. So one thing I'd like to say about these unit vectors is that the dot product of any unit vector with itself will always equal one. Also, the dot product of any unit vector with a different unit vector always equals zero. So for instance, if I took i hat dot i hat or j hat dot j hat or k hat dot k hat, just dotting the same unit vector with itself, that's always gonna give me one. But if I did i hat dot j hat or i hat dot k hat or j hat dot k hat, just two different unit vectors being dotted together, I'm always getting zero. So let me show you why that is. Okay, so let's start with the dot product of a unit vector with itself. So for example, i hat dotted with i hat. What is that gonna equal? Well, just use what we learned a second ago, which is that the dot product is equal to the magnitude of the first vector, so the magnitude of i hat, times the magnitude of the second vector, which that's also the magnitude of i hat, and then cosine of the angle between the two vectors. But in this case, uh, we're talking about the same vector, right? So they're pointing in the same direction, which means there's zero degrees between them, okay? So if we work this out, term by term, the magnitude of i hat is one because it's a unit vector. Then we have the magnitude of i hat once again. And then cosine of zero, by the way, also works out to one, which is why the dot product also works out to one. On the other hand, if we take a unit vector and then dot it with a different unit vector, let's say i hat dot j hat, this is how that will work out. So I take the magnitude of the first one, i hat, magnitude of the second one, j hat, and then cosine of the angle between i hat and j hat. But here's the thing, i hat points in the x direction, j hat points in the y direction, and what's the angle between those two? It's not zero, in this case, they're perpendicular, and the angle is 90 degrees, okay? So therefore, uh, when we work this out term by term, we have one for the magnitude of i hat, one for the magnitude of j hat, but the cosine of 90 is zero, and that's always gonna give us zero. So the, again, the takeaway is, if you take the dot product of a unit vector with itself, you get one. You take the dot product of a unit vector with a different unit vector, you get zero, and that's why. Okay, so it turns out there's actually another way to think about the dot product, and that's in terms of components. So in other words, if we have two vectors, a and b, and we're trying to calculate a dot b, we can do this by thinking about the x, y, and the z components of each vector. So I'm gonna show you how to do it that way. So let's look at a dot b in terms of those components. Uh, and let's just stick to x and y for now. Um, so for a, we would say ax times i hat plus ay times j hat. That's how we break that vector into x and y components. And at the same time, Vector b would be bx times i hat plus by times j hat. That's how we just write that vector 
in component form also. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, since we have a term in parentheses times another term in parentheses, we're going to use FOIL to expand that out. And what I mean by that is you get first, outside, inside, and last, the FOIL method of expanding this product out. Okay, so the first term, if you think about it, is going to be AX times BX, but then you'll have I hat dot I hat in this first term. Okay, the next term you'll have uh, is going to be this one right here when we multiply this term uh, by this term. So we'll have AY times BX, and then we'll have J hat dot I hat. Okay, the next term is by multiplying this and this together, which is AX times BY times I hat dot J hat. And then finally, we'll, we'll multiply this term by this term. And we'll get AY times BY J hat dot J hat. Don't worry, this is about to get a lot simpler because we're gonna use the fact we just proved that a unit vector dotted with itself is one and a unit vector dotted with a different unit vector is zero. So in other words, where do you see a unit vector dotted with a different unit vector? In the second term and the third term here. So we know both of those are going away. They're both going to zero. And you're only left with the first term and the last term. And by the way, each one of those has i hat dot i hat, that's going to one, j hat dot j hat, that's also going to one. So this actually becomes very simple. Um, you get ax bx plus ay by. So that's how it works for a two-dimensional vector with x and y components. You can actually generalize this to any number of components. Uh, for example, if we were in 3D, you'd have ax bx plus ay by plus az bz. And you could actually keep going. If you had you know, a 20-dimensional vector, you would just keep going with 20 terms. The idea is you multiply the x components together, multiply the y components together, you multiply components together and just add up. That's how it works. Okay, so let's do an example. The question here says, we wanna find the angle between these two vectors, A and B, where A is 5.5 meters per second I hat minus 4.3 meters per second J hat, and vector B is seven, uh, negative seven meters per second I hat plus nine meters per second J hat. So if we plot them out and put them on the same graph, we can see that vector A is pointing in the fourth quadrant over here, and vector B is in the second quadrant over there, but we can figure out the angle between them using dot products. So let's see how that works. Okay, so let's work this one out. I'm going to start by writing down the two different definitions of the dot product that we've seen so far. So we have a dot b. We know that we can write this as magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times cosine of the angle between the two vectors. That's one way. But also, we can think of it as ax bx plus uh, ay by. So these are equivalent ways of thinking about the dot product. Now notice that what we're trying to figure out here is theta, the angle between our two vectors. So to isolate this on one side of the equation, I'll write cosine theta is equal to, and then we'll have ax bx plus ay by. And then we'll divide out the magnitude of a and the magnitude of b. By the way, ax, ay, bx, by, that's all given to us in this problem. We're given the components. So the last thing we need to do is remember, how do I write down the magnitude of a vector in terms of the components? So here, let's copy down what's on top, ax, bx, plus ay, by, divide by. Okay, the magnitude of a is the square root ax squared plus ay squared. This is how you find the magnitude of a vector using the Pythagorean theorem. And the same thing goes for vector b. You take the square root of bx squared plus 
by squared. That's just how magnitudes work when you have a two-dimensional vector like this. So in the next step, we'll just plug in the numbers. Okay, now vector A had an x component of 5.5. Vector B had an x component of negative 7. Okay, and then we'll add a y. So vector A had a y component of minus 4.3. And by was 9. So vector B had a y component of 9. And then on the bottom, what we'll have is the square root of ax squared, so that's 5.5 squared, and then plus negative 4.3 squared. And then we'll have the square root for the magnitude of b, we'll have bx, which is minus seven, square that, and then plus uh, nine, and square that as well. So that's kind of a big calculation to make, but you're just gonna get some number out and that number is minus 0 0.9698. Keep three sig figs on that, by the way. And, and what we're saying is the cosine of theta is equal to that number. So if I want the angle theta itself, what I'm gonna have to do is take the inverse cosine of that number. So cosine inverse of minus 0.9698. Keeping three sig figs, which gives us about 166 degrees. That's the angle between the two vectors. So notice how we were able to get that fairly straightforwardly by using the dot product. Okay, here's the next question. And again, uh, after I read the question to you, I'd like you to pause the video and try to work it out. So consider these two vectors, A and B, shown below in component form. So A is minus 2i hat plus 4j hat minus 1k hat. B is 2i hat plus a half j hat minus 2k hat. The question here is, are the two vectors perpendicular? This is just a simple yes or no question. Try to figure out if they're perpendicular. So my hint is calculate the dot product. So see if you can work this out and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so we'll start by computing the dot product, a dot b. And the most efficient way to do that in this case is to use the components. We can write this as ax bx plus ay by plus az bz. That's how we do this by component. So now um, we can just directly plug in what we know. ax, that's the x component of vector a is minus two. bx was two, ay was four, by was a half. And then finally, AZ was minus 1, and BZ was minus 2. So we have minus 4 for the first term. 4 times a half is 2, plus 2. Uh, but then we get another plus 2. We take minus 1 multiplied by minus 2. So that's all 0 when we add it up. So the dot product between vectors A and B is 0. This does mean that they're perpendicular. but I can show you why that is. So remember that a dot b can also be written as the magnitude of a, magnitude of b, times cosine of the angle theta between them, which means we can write the cosine of the angle theta between the two vectors as a dot b divided by the magnitude of a and the magnitude of b. Sorry, I don't know why this is not coming out, but hopefully you see what I'm writing. Um, well, in this case, what's on top, a dot b, is equal to zero. So regardless of what the magnitudes on the bottom are, we have cosine theta is equal to zero. So if I wanna know what theta is, I'll just take the inverse cosine of zero, and what is that? It's 90 degrees, which again means they're perpendicular. So yeah, these two vectors are perpendicular. And whenever the dot product of two vectors comes out to zero, you know that means they're perpendicular. Okay, so that was a little bit of a math detour to talk about dot products and how to calculate them. So now that we're familiar with that, 
we can go back to what we were talking about before, which is work. So remember that the work done by a constant force can be calculated using W equals FD cosine phi. That's the formula we've discussed earlier. And I want you to look real closely at that formula and hopefully you'll notice something about it that looks familiar. So in the first term, we have F, which is the magnitude of the force. And then we have D, which is the distance you move. But we can also think of that as a magnitude of a vector in some sense. And then we have cosine of phi, which would be the angle between the force vector and the direction of motion. So the form of this kind of looks like a dot product because we have the magnitude of two vectors and then the cosine of the angle between them. That's pretty much what a dot product is. So in other words, we can rewrite this formula in terms of a dot product, and that's gonna be done right here. So W is equal to F dot delta R. This is another way, equivalent way of thinking about work. And the force, uh, and then F is what we call the force vector. So it's a full-fledged vector now. It's not just the magnitude. Delta R is what we call the displacement vector. Okay, so the, the object is undergoing some kind of displacement that's delta R while this force F is acting on it. You take the dot product of those two, you get the work. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about displacement. So displacement is defined as a change in position. It's a vector that points from your initial position where you start to your final position where you end up. And the way it's calculated, delta R is equal to R final minus R initial. So remember, this is the delta notation that's so common in physics where you take the final minus the initial value. In this case, we're talking about position. So delta R would be R final minus R initial. That's how we think about displacement. And so with all that in mind, let's do an example where we calculate work. So a rope is used to pull a crate across uh, the floor. Uh, and there's a constant tension of 550 newtons in the rope. The rope makes an angle of 35 degrees with the ground. How much work must be done in units of joules to move the box a distance of 12 meters? Okay, so we're going to use the formulas that we've been developing so far to calculate the work uh, in this scenario. Let's work it out. Okay, so we'll start here. The formula for work that we first developed was FD cos phi, where F is the magnitude of the force, D is the distance moved, and then phi is the angle between our force vector and the direction of motion. So we can actually directly calculate the answer using this because the magnitude of the force is 550 newtons, the distance moved is 12 meters, and the angle in this case is 35, um, let's try that again. The yeah, angle is 35 degrees, so we have cosine of 35 degrees right there. Now, if you crunch these numbers, what you're going to get is 5,406. The units are newtons times meters, because that's what appears in the previous expression. Also, we're going to keep two sig figs on this answer. So we'll have 5,400. And then remember that newtons times meters is equivalent to a joule. So 5,400 joules is the answer. Now there's another way to do this calculation, which is to say that the work is the force vector dotted with delta R, the displacement vector. So what I'm gonna do here is write down the force vector in terms of X and Y components and do the same thing with displacement and then just verify that we get the same answer when we dot those two vectors together. So here, I'm gonna set up my axes. X is gonna be going this way. Y is gonna be going straight up. And if we draw the force vector, let's start with that. We know that it's kind of pointing up and to the right like this. We can break this down into components. Because of course we know uh, that Fy is the component that goes along the y direction, and Fx is the component that goes along the x direction. 
and this is the angle phi that we've been referring to. If I want the x component, that's going to be the magnitude of my vector times cosine of the angle phi. Uh, the reason for that is the x component is the adjacent side of this triangle, and cosine goes with the adjacent side. Plug in what we know. We've got 550 newtons cosine of 35 degrees. This works out to about 450 and then 0.5 newtons. So we'll keep two sig figs on that. Also, uh, if we do the y component, if you look at the triangle we constructed, Fy is the opposite side. So we know opposite goes with sine. We have the magnitude of the force times sine of the angle phi, which would be 550 newtons sine of 35 degrees. If you crunch those numbers, you get about 315.5 newtons. Okay, so that's how you break the force down into x and y. Okay, as for delta r, this is our displacement. So we know that it just points straight along the floor from, from left to right, because this is the way the box is moving. Okay, so if I write this in terms of components, okay, the x component is 12. We move 12 meters in the x direction. But the y component is 0, because we don't move in the y direction at all, actually. So to write each one of these as a full-fledged vector, just to have this on the page, we have f equals 450.5 newtons i hat plus 315.5 newtons j hat, and then delta r equals 12 meters i hat plus zero j hat. That's, that's how you write these as vectors. Okay, so the work then, since we're doing a dot product of these two vectors, remember that I can take the x components of the two vectors and multiply them, so that would be 450.5 newtons times 12 meters, and then add that to what we get when we multiply the y components, which would be 315.5 um, newtons times zero. Okay, so we're multiplying the x components over here, we're multiplying the y components over here, and we're adding that together. That's how we do a dot product. And if you work this out, you'll see that it comes out to the exact same answer as before, we get uh, 5,406. The units are also newtons times meters, so that works out the same. And we know that when we round this to the right sig figs, we get 5,400 joules. So we get the same answer. Admittedly, this way is way longer, but sometimes this is a more convenient way to think about it. It depends on the situation, okay? But know that we can calculate the work in these two different ways. All right, so we've seen how to deal with the case of a constant force and how to calculate the work associated with that. So next, we're gonna move on to variable forces. So how do we calculate the work done by a force that is changing over time? That's the next topic. And the general strategy is outlined here. So before we get into that, let's draw a picture of what's going on. So we are, we're imagining we have an object which starts off over here at initial position r sub i, and then it moves along this path, and then it ends up over here at the final position rf. And then all the while, there's a force acting on it, uh, which we'll label as f, and again, f can be changing in some way. So we know that if the force were constant, the way we could work this out is just to do f dot delta r where F is the force and delta R is the overall displacement. So the way we handle the variable force is to introduce some calculus. So we're gonna take this path that the object moves over and we're gonna break it down into infinitesimal segments. So tiny, tiny little pieces. And for each one of those segments, we can calculate the work 
it's going to be an infinitesimal amount of work. So the way we write this is dw, and that's given by f dot dr. So dr is still a displacement, okay? But it's a tiny, tiny little displacement, uh, an infinitesimal amount of displacement along the path. So if we have this infinitesimal bit of work, we can integrate that over the entire path to get the total work, okay? So, so this becomes now an integral. The work done is gonna be the integral f dot dr over the path. So that goes from r initial to r final. Those would be the limits of integration. That's the general strategy for how we deal with uh, variable forces. We turn uh, the expression for work into an integral. Okay, so we've seen the general strategy for how we deal with the work done by a variable force. But in this class, we're gonna restrict ourselves to one dimension. So in other words, we're only gonna need to know how to do this in one dimension. So we're gonna consider an object moving in one dimension. Let's say it's the X axis. Okay, so it's just moving along this line here. And while it's doing that, there's a force acting on it, which we call F of X. So what this means is the force is a function of position. It depends on the position, All right? So we start here at X initial, and then we end up here at X final. And the question is, how do we sort of calculate the work done by that force uh, over the entire path? So what we'll do is we'll divide the path into tiny little segments, as, as we said earlier. And let's say there are gonna be N different segments, okay? and the length of each segment will be delta x. So here's how it looks when we divide the path. So here's the first segment. It has to move over that first segment. There's the second one and the third and so on. And the last one will be n. And you see how each one of them has a, has a length of delta x. So we, we've split the path up into these little segments. So the total work that's done over the total path is gonna be the sum of the work for each one of those little segments. So we'll have the work done for segment number one. Let's call that delta W1, that's what that is. And then we'll have the work done during the trip over the second segment, which is delta W2. And then of course we just keep doing that until we get to the last segment, which is delta WN, okay? Now, each one of those little terms is basically a force times a displacement, okay? So in segment one over here, the force, we're gonna call that F1. How far did it move? That's delta X, because that's the length of the segment. Okay, and then in segment number two, let's say the force was F2, and then again, the length of the segment is delta X, and then we just keep doing that until we get to the last one, which is Fn, that's the force in the last segment times delta x. And if we wanna write this in a more compact way in summation notation, this would be the sum from i equals one to n of f sub i times delta x. That's just another way of saying we're taking force times that little displacement and then we're summing over all of the different segments that we divided this path up into. Okay, so, so that's how we think about the work. It's this big sum over these different segments of, of F times delta X. There's actually a way you can visualize this graphically, which is really important. So I'm gonna show you this. So on this graph, we have force, that's F on the vertical axis, and we have X, that's position on the horizontal axis. And this red curve is telling us that our force is variable. So it changes, the force changes depending on where we're located, depending on what the value of X is. Okay, so this is just a general variable force of some kind. Now, let's think about what each little term in the sum is telling us. It's telling us we're taking the force times a little delta X. Well, the force is the height of the graph, right? Because force is on the vertical axis. So F is the height of the graph, and delta x is a little width along the graph, okay? So when we put that together, we can think of f 
times delta x as being a little rectangular area, and that's what's shown in blue here. Think of that as a little rectangular area. And of course, that's just one of the segments. So the height of the rectangle is f, the width of the rectangle is delta x. Now, if we do the entire sum, okay, and not just look at one of the segments, but look at all of them, well, then we'll have a whole bunch of little rectangular areas that we need to add together, and those are shown in, uh, in the gold color here. Okay, so we're, we're adding up all those different rectangular areas. Now we can ask the question, what happens where delta x goes to zero? If we let delta x get really small, in other words, we're, we're breaking the path up into smaller and smaller intervals, right? Well, that turns the sum over here into an integral, which is shown over here. So in other words, the work becomes the integral from x initial to x final of the force over x. Okay, so we go from x initial to x final, and inside the integral we have force times dx. So we're integrating the force to get the work. So the graphical interpretation of this, we know that the integral is the area under the curve, okay? So if we have a force versus position graph like this, it's the area under the curve that gives us the work. If we calculate the area under the curve, we get the work. Okay, so to give you one example of this, uh, let's consider a particle that moves along the x-axis while under the influence of a force, which is given by the function shown here. So f of x is f0 times e to the minus x divided by x0. In this function, f0 and x0 are both constants. What we're going to show is that the work required to move the particle from the origin, that's x equals zero, to infinity, x equals infinity, is gonna be given by f zero times x zero. Okay, so in this example, if I wanna calculate the work, I have to integrate this function right here over x. And what this is telling me to do is go from zero to infinity when I evaluate that integral. So. Let's see if we can get the answer by doing the integral. Okay, so we know that what we're dealing with is a variable force in one dimension. So we already saw that the way this works is we're gonna integrate from x initial to x final, and we're gonna integrate the force itself. So this is f of x, and that way we can calculate the work. So in our case, our initial position is zero, we start at the origin, and our final position is infinity. Also, the function for the force, remember, is f zero e to the minus x over x zero, like this, and then we have dx. So that's the integral we need to perform. The rest of this is just sort of working out the integral. And there are different ways you can do this, but I'm going to do a u substitution. So I'm going to say let u equal minus x over x zero. Okay, so I can sub in u for what's in the exponent over here. But we also have to change the limits of integration if we're changing the variable from x to u. Okay, so here, let's start with the lower limit. So if I plug in x equals zero, which is our lower limit, I'm gonna have minus zero over x naught. Well, that's still zero, so the lower limit is still zero. How about the upper limit? Well, u is equal to minus infinity over x naught, if I plug in infinity for x. So that gives me minus infinity. So, so notice how my limits of integration have changed because I've changed the variables. Okay, there's something else we have to do because I have a dx in, in the original equation. I need to sub that out as well. So what I'm gonna do is the derivative du dx, okay? What's the derivative of u with respect to x? Well, basically, um, 
I have a minus sign, and then the derivative of x is just 1, and then x0 is a constant, so that's on the bottom right there. Okay, so if I take the derivative of what I defined as u earlier, I have minus 1 over x0. And what that means is dx, if we take that expression I just wrote down and solve for dx, what you'll get is minus x0 times du. So now we're ready to make all of those substitutions. So the work is equal to, remember I changed the limits, now I'm going from 0 to minus infinity. I have the f0 out front uh, in the integral already. And then minus x over x0, that's u, so I have e to the u. And then dx is minus x0 times du. Okay, we can simplify this quite a bit because, well, first of all, I can pull out a negative sign to the front. F0 is a constant, so I can pull that out. And, D, and X0 is also a constant, so I can pull that out. And then I have the integral from 0 to minus infinity, e to the u du. Okay, so this integral is actually very simple. This is one you just need to remember e to some power, like e to the u, just integrates to e to the u, okay? For an exponential function like this, when you integrate it, you just get that same function back. And we're taking this from zero to minus infinity. Those are the limits. Okay, so I have minus f0, x0. Now I'll plug in the limits. I have to start by plugging in the top limit, which is e to the minus infinity, then plug in the bottom limit, so I subtract e to the zero, and that's how I evaluate this integral at the limits. So I have minus f zero, x zero. Okay, e to the minus infinity. That approaches zero, so if you take e to a really large but negative power, as that power gets bigger and bigger, uh, that'll approach zero. e to the zero power is just one. So in the brackets, we have zero minus one, which is just minus one, which cancels out with the negative sign out front, giving us f zero, x zero. That's what we were trying to prove in the first place, okay? So that's just one example of how you can take a variable force integrate it, and then calculate the work that way. So we'll continue on with this in the next video. We'll stop this one here. Until then, take care. I'll see you in the next